So rate, whereas it's known for enzymes activity. We talked about a few things that can change it, concentration of reagents, things like that. But a big one right here, we're gonna talk about being able to slightly inhibit or permanently inhibit. And even an idea for the range we're talking about, most catalysts run between 10 to the two times faster up to 10 to the seven times faster. So sometimes the weaker catalysts, they only make a reaction go 100 times quicker. Sometimes they go 10 million times quicker. Getting beyond those multipliers gets hard. There's only so fast molecules can run into each other. So it's kind of the upper limit. 10 to the seven tends to be the fastest um, that t things tend to go. So how do we adjust it? It's great if your reaction is doing what you want, but once you've made enough of something, you, you want it to stop. And there's no off switch. You can't just turn off an enzyme like you could turn off a machine. It's just constantly there, bumping into stuff and reacting. So we need inhibitors. There's a couple types of inhibitor. We're going to start with the first one. We're going to talk about irreversible. These are permanently shut down. An irreversible inhibitor permanently disables the enzyme. There's a couple ways this can happen. You can react with a side group. So think back, we have those alpha helixes with R groups. If one of those R groups, say was originally a, or say was an anion, and you react with it, so you add, I don't know, NH3 to it. And now it's polar, but you know, you kicked off OH minus somewhere. You turn it into an amide. That's not the same. It just doesn't have the same interactions. It doesn't attract the molecules quite the same. It doesn't have to take up the same amount of space. This means that, you know, whatever our group we were using, is no longer what it needs to be. And so if you react with the active site R groups, you can just destroy it. It becomes something that no longer does the job. It no longer fits what's supposed to fit there. So reacting with the side groups one way, cutting the backbone. So if you've got, you know, big protein and something comes along and just slashes it right here. What will happen is, oops, the part that got broke, cut, can just drift away. If that happens, well, whatever our active site used to be, say we used to have an active site here in the middle, they've drifted apart. They're no longer there. If you cut the backbone, the protein falls apart. And you don't even have to cut the part near the active site. If you cut a part elsewhere, the protein tends to change its shape. Think of like a Jenga tower. Just removing one piece can cause a lot of it to collapse. As a result, cutting the backbone is a pretty common way of permanently destroying an enzyme. And then there is a permanent attachment to active site. So what can happen with this one, this is a inhibitor that finds the active site and then instead of being the substrate, it's some other molecule that just sticks there forever. It never lets go. Um, so normally the molecule is supposed to fit into the active site and then pop out later once it's reacted. But if you put a similar molecule that will fit but will never come back out, nothing can ever go back to that active site. And so a permanent irreversible inhibitor is one that can bind to the active site and never let go. So there's a few types of irreversible inhibition. Examples for these would be things like cyanide poisoning, um, cytochrome, oh, is it cytochrome C oxidase, is vital in metabolism so that we can produce energy. Inside it is an iron. So there's an iron attached to an enzyme around it. 
Alright, so some connections iron. Cyanide will come up, attack the iron, and rip it out, and you will get iron cyanide. I think it's four of them. And your protein will be left just on its own with no iron in it. As a result, the active site is missing its iron. It can no longer react. That active site has been permanently modified. And so in this case, it's removing the cofat or yeah, cofactor. But it's an example of a permanent inhibition. Other ones, penicillin. And also sulfur drugs and stuff. These block bacterial cell wall synthesis. So there's an enzyme that helps build the cell wall that makes the lipids that grow the cell wall bacteria. Penicillin is an irreversible inhibitor of them. It sticks to the active site, breaks it, and then the bacteria can no longer grow its cell, which means it can no longer divide. And so as it tries to do so, it dies and it perishes. And so penicillin was really good at that. Problem is we overused it, so the active site slowly mutates over time. Different bacteria have slightly different versions. And what would happen is, well, penicillin wouldn't fit in one of them. And so eventually the bacteria became resistant as the ones that penicillin didn't infect were the only ones that survived. We modified penicillin a lot to try to adjust for the new active sites. There's a lot of something psyllins, my, my psyllins, a few other ones. They're all derived from penicillin, the original one. We just added a methyl or a butyl or we changed one to be slightly polar. Um, sadly, penicillin is not very effective for most things anymore um, because of those mutations of the enzyme, the result was we didn't fit in the active site, penicillin no longer inhibited it. A century-ish ago when we discovered penicillin, you got a shot to fight off gonorrhea. Four hours later you were gonorrhea free. That was one of the early work uses was a prophylactic treatment, but the idea was it was a way to treat VD. Unfortunately, Today, they don't even use it for it. Uh, super gonorrhea is basically resistant to almost every version of antibiotics we have. Penicillin does nothing to it anymore. So these type of active site inhibitors are a problem if we're using them to kill off bacteria and the like because they become resistant to it as evolution kicks in and modifies the active site. And one more example, ricin. So ricin, castor beans have a little bit of ricin in them. That is, the plant doesn't want you eating the seed, and so it puts a poison in. Ricin is very deadly because it breaks ribosomes. So we'll talk about ribosomes more in DNA, but ribosomes are what creates proteins. So you read your DNA, it goes out into your cell, your ribosome reads the RNA that leaves your cell and or nucleus and says, hmm, all right, here's the three-letter code. That means alanine. The next three letters mean valine. The next three letters mean arginine. Whatever the order of your amino acid, it builds them. So without a ribosome, you can't build any proteins. Um, this is why ricin's deadly. It destroys them. It just cuts the backbone. It cuts a protein in the ribosome. Ribosomes are actually multiple proteins and some RNA, like they're very complex, large constructions, um, big, big quaternary structures. So it just cuts one protein and a single ricin can do about 1500 ribosomes per minute. It's a catalyst, it's an enzyme that breaks them. And so it just keeps breaking them. And so it kills all the ribosomes in the cell. The cell can't get more. It needs ribosomes to grow ribosomes. And so the cell dies. Ricin is very deadly, but it also has a lag time because you 
you have some reasonable amounts of proteins built up. Ribosomes go away, and you're not going to realize for a little bit that you're not making the proteins you need. Eventually, though, the things that we regenerate every day aren't being regenerated, and, well, there's nothing we can do at that point. By the time you know you've gotten ricin poisoning, it's too late to do anything about it. So here's an example of irreversible inhibitors. There's also reversible. Reversible inhibitors come in two types. There is competitive and non-competitive. A competitive inhibitor is just anything that sticks in the active site that will come out, but for a little while is blocking the active site. So competitive binds in active site. Sometimes the active site just does fit other things, not as well, and maybe not in a way where they'll react, but they can kind of fit for a little bit. Have you ever had a key that you could put in a door but it wouldn't turn? You have that idea, like sometimes similar keys will fit in the lock but they won't twist. That's the idea of a competitive inhibitor. As long as it's in the way, the real thing can't get in. So for a little while, your enzyme can't react with anything. So if it normally does 100 reactions per second, and for 20 of those seconds, oh sorry, for 20% of that time is a competitive inhibitor in the way, then you only get 80 per second that round, and so you just don't make as much. And so competitive inhibitors slow your enzyme down by simply being in the way. You can't do the reaction if something's blocking the active site. Well, there's also non-competitive, and these take a little bit of discussion. So let's let's think alpha helix, alpha helix, some beta sheet alpha helix. We're going to say our active site is over here. So blue active site. Sometimes what will happen is if you have some R groups over here, that another molecule can stick to, it can bend the whole molecule. Like all this would bend up a little bit. You'd get a structure that was a little bit different than you expected. Well, as a result, things don't fit the same as they did before. You'll notice this third alpha helix land twists over a little bit, it kind of rotates. We, we've changed the shape by having something over here bend part of the backbone, the result is that the active site has shifted. It, it's not quite the same shape it was before. A non-competitive inhibitor, which is what we're looking at here, which I should probably label. So non-competitive. These bind to other locations. They, the protein's big. There's way more spots than just the active site. These are called allosteric. Allosteric sites. They're just other parts of the protein. But if you bend one part, it pulls in all the others, and it can deform the whole shape. I mean, if you've got to lay a towel out and grab one end and twist it a little bit, it'll cause ripples to move through the whole thing. This is what's going on with a non-competitive. It is disrupting the active site, and as a result, a disrupted active site is less reactive. This can be either it doesn't work for a while, or you might have just moved the distances a little further, and so it doesn't quite fit as well so the substrate doesn't stick quite as well as you want. And so it's just a little less good at doing its job. Um, there's a couple different, it could be fully shut down or just reduce speed. Depends on the enzyme. This is the idea of a non-competitive inhibitor. It binds somewhere else on the protein and slightly adjusts how fast the reaction can go because it slightly bends the protein out of its best shape. Where does this come in really handy? Well, this is actually really useful because 
If you've got an enzyme, we'll just call it E, and it reacts with A and it makes B. So E is the catalyst. Well, if there's a ton of A around, then you're going to be making a ton of B. So you just got your factory here. A's come in and they leave as B's. Now if I have a bunch of A, it's just going to keep reacting with it. It's just going to all flood in. I'm going to make a ton of B. Now, the problem is you might only want a little B. How do you turn off your factory? Well, you can't. The protein's just there. You could disable it by destroying it, but that means you have to make a new one every time. What you can do, though, is if you have some R groups and B fits into them, and it's an inhibitor. So this is a situation where B inhibits enzyme. What this means is that early on when you have no B, right, this enzyme is working at 100%. It's cranking away. But the more B I make, the slower the enzyme starts getting. It goes down to 90, and then it goes down to 80, and then it goes down to 70. The more B I make, the slower my enzyme gets. It goes down to 40%. As more of it tends to be sticking. Now B comes on and off, like B goes on, B goes off, B goes on, B goes off. They attach for a little while. So generally what happens is, initially it's making 100 per second. And then, now 10% of the time, a B is stuck on it and it's turned off. And then it pops off, it starts running, but it only has 90% of the time to run, so it only makes 90% as much. The more B you have, the more likely B is to attach. The more Bs I have, the more of them can bounce and hit it. This is self-inhibition. It actually allows you to design an enzyme in a way that it regulates itself. If you want there to always be a certain amount of whatever compound B around, then you design it so that amount of B basically turns off the enzyme or at least slows it down to match the rate that you're consuming whatever compound B is. And so no matter how much A you have, it'll slow down and leave lots of A around to only have a certain amount of B. And so when your product is an inhibitor for the enzyme that made that product, that is self-inhibition. It's a very handy control mechanism. And so a lot of enzymes have evolved this. Sometimes, you know, if we have B1, it goes to B, and then B reacts with a second enzyme to go to C, and that reacts with some third enzyme to go to D. It's not always the product. Sometimes a later product inhibits. So it's possible that C could inhibit enzyme one. And so sometimes you chain multiple molecules and a later molecule inhibits an earlier stage. But the idea is these non-competitive inhibitors allow us to control how much of a molecule your body actually keeps around. This is actually a lot of the difference in people's just health and existence. Slightly different enzymes mean, you know, I might have a rate where I'm always keeping 20B inside my cell. But the person next to me might have a slightly different enzyme, like version, slightly different version of the gene, and they have 18 in their cell at any given time. Well, that can be good or bad. Maybe it's, you know, how much alcohol dehydrogenase, and so somebody just has a higher alcohol tolerance. Or maybe it's how much sugar you keep around, and so your cells always have a little bit more, and so they have more access to energy. Or maybe they have a little bit less. They can be good and bad to have more or less in different situations. And that slight difference between one person's genetics and another plays out in a slight variance between all of humans. Um, 
so it adjusts the amounts of chemicals that you have slightly depending on how good it is at inhibiting those enzymes. And well, I like one last example, just because it's a neat piece of info. Alcohol reacts with alcohol dehydrogenase. Basically makes you vinegar, among some other steps. Well, ethylene glycol is just, I have a second OH. It's instead of one or FN one all, it's FN one two diol. This is similar enough, it reacts with the same enzyme. The problem is you get oxalic acid. This is deadly. So ethylene glycol is antifreeze. And if you've ever you know been told about the dangers of antifreeze, it kills pets all the time. If it leaks in a garage, it's very sweet, but it causes death. It doesn't actually hurt anything on its own. What happens is in your body it gets processed into this molecule, and this can result in muscle inhibition. It prevents your muscles from being able to properly contract, which means your diaphragm can't contract. You can't breathe, or usually a pet cat or something. This is an example of a very similar molecule fitting the active site of an enzyme, and the metabolites of it, the things that are produced by your body enzymes reacting it, they are hazardous. Which actually means there's an easy way to fight this. If you now it's best to get to a hospital or a vet as fast as possible. If you ever see a child or a pet drink ethylene glycol, drink any antifreeze. But barring that ability, you can just give alcohol. Well, this might seem a little odd to give a child or a pet some alcohol, and you want to size it to their size. An adult might be 90 kilograms, but a 5 kilogram cat needs 120th what we need. Um, but the idea is, I've got my active site. It can fit two things. It could have the dangerous ethylene glycol, or it could have the ethanol. If you just give a whole bunch of ethanol, then many of the times, ethylene glycol tries to go to the active site, it can't. There's something in there. Effectively, by adding a bunch of ethanol from liquor, you are acting as a competitive inhibitor to the glycol reacting, to the antifreeze. The antifreeze tries to react, it goes, oops, never mind, there's something in the active site, and it bumps away. This gives time for your body to urinate out the antifreeze. It's, you know, again, it's not the best. Giving a child or a pet liquor is a very hard thing to figure out the right amounts for. Um, but it is actually a workable treatment for ethylene glycol poisoning if you get on it quick. Um, best to get into the hospital as fast as possible, however. And so just one more example of kind of the interesting interplay of what does it mean to be an inhibitor? This is a competitive inhibitor simply because, well, ethanol is a already good at reacting with the active site. So if it's in there, you just gotta wait. It's like somebody's in the bathroom already. You've gotta wait outside. Ethylene glycol's trying to get in, but it can't until whatever's there leaves. And so it slows how fast your ethylene glycol is reacting. 